Hello everyone, Ethan Mitchell here, and today we will take a look at the Peridonafi. So I finally received the Peridonafi, and I gotta tell you, initial impressions of this thing, I'm very impressed. So in this video, we are gonna do a super quick unboxing, and then we're gonna take a very close look at the drone and the app and really see what Parrot has to offer. Doing a quick unboxing, we have the remote, drone, paperwork, and a full set of replacement props and a prop tool. In the case, we have the drone, USB cable, that is USB-C to USB-A, and there is an SD card adapter. The 16 gigabyte SanDisk industry card comes installed in the drone already. You can see here that I've actually switched the card out for a SanDisk Extreme Plus 64 gigabyte card. Using a Samsung fast charger, both the drone and the remote took about an hour and a half to recharge. Using a MacBook Pro 2017 charger that has USB-C PD capabilities, I have seen much faster charge times. Going around the drone, we can see that it is very small when folded. Here it is side by side to the DJI Spark. It is very light and does feel very toy-like due to the lightweight construction and flexibility of the plastic. The arms are very secure when placed in the open position with an audible click. The arms are also very flexible in torsion and feel like they would do very well in a crash. There are antenna mounted on each leg giving 360 degree coverage. The two axis gimbal can turn 180 degrees up and down, and the speed can also be adjusted in the app. The gimbal shocks feel fairly secure, more so than a Mavic Pro, less than a Spark, somewhere in between. The circuit board on the inside of the drone is also mounted on shocks, so this combined with the flexibility of the body will definitely help in a crash. The sensors on the bottom include an optical flow camera and ultrasonic sensor. The Anafi weighs just a smidge over the Spark at 317 grams. That's just 15 grams over the Spark at 302. The Anafi battery weighs 126 grams, which is 30 grams over the Spark battery at 96. The props are very thin and flexible and have a noise reduction design. A full replacement set is included along with a Torx tool to replace. The drone will power up in under 20 seconds with a single quick press of their power button. Going around the controller, we can see that it is pretty bulky compared to a DJI Spark remote. The controller is pretty heavy, but feels very balanced with a phone in place. The remote does feel a little narrow for my hands and the joysticks are pretty close together compared to the DJI controller but nothing you can't get used to. The remote holds a Galaxy S7 Edge with slim case just fine, but the Apple S6 wants to pop out. So you may have to remove your case when using an iPhone. I really like how the remote powers up as soon as you flip it open. That is extremely convenient and aids in getting the drone up quickly. The remote has two plugs, USB-C for charging and USB-A for connecting to your device. The right trigger starts and stops video and also takes pictures. The right toggle is pressed down to zoom in and up to zoom out. The left trigger resets the gimbal tilt to zero to look forward. The left toggle is pressed to tilt the gimbal up and down. I really like this design because it never fails that on a DJI remote, I always forget which way to turn the dial to tilt the gimbal. The takeoff and land button and return to home are located in the middle of the remote and are very responsive. There is not a battery level indicator light on the remote itself, so you must connect to the app to view battery level of the remote. Using a Galaxy S7 Edge, the firmware update did hang up on the first go around, but I think this is a common issue and has something to do with the phone disconnecting from the USB cable. I simply canceled the update power cycled the drone and controller and restarted the process and it went through just fine. So let's run through the app and see how it looks. On the first screen, we can see connection status, battery level of the drone and controller, SD card status, setting icon, the in-app shop, 
gallery, terms of use, and data confidentiality. Updates are shown at the top of the screen next to the drone and remote icons. Press the drone icon at the top of the screen to access the calibration menu. In this menu, you can view the drone's firmware as well as calibrate the compass and camera gimbal. Next, I did a compass calibration. Parrot calls it a magnetic meter, and I found this to be very sensitive as I had to hold the drone up in the middle of the room to get it to calibrate successfully. There is no IMU calibration as found on DJI app. This menu also has a map indicating the drone's current location, and you can also activate the drone's audible alarm by pressing the bell icon. This will help you locate your drone in the event that you have a crash and you can't find it. Parrot has really gone in the opposite direction of other drone manufacturers by allowing the user to make the choice whether to share personal flight information or not. You can choose to share your information or not share at any time. Along the same lines of data collection, Parrot has also chosen not to include restrictive no-fly zone software. Going back to the main menu, you can see that once the remote has made a connection to the drone, the fly button turns green. Once in the flight menu, we can see that all telemetry information is at the top of the screen. Flight modes and camera settings are located at the bottom of the screen within easy reach of your thumbs. Settings are located at the top right of the screen by a gear icon. Going into settings, we can see several options, remote interface, piloting, safety, camera, and network settings. Under interface, you can choose between four different control modes, change map settings, enable hand launch, and enable grid framing. Under piloting, you can change the speed of all flight controls in film and sport mode. Under safety, you can enable a geofence and set the maximum altitude and distance. In camera settings, we can calibrate the gimbal, set auto record on takeoff, enable the zoom, set the delay for timed photos, set hyperlapse speed, and enable anti-flicker. Under network, we can change the Anafi's Wi-Fi name and set a password if using a phone only. You can also change the Wi-Fi channel and frequency if needed. Going back to the flight screen, to the bottom left, we have flight modes. Under speed is where you can switch between film and sport modes. Under piloting, you can choose between manual flight, cameraman, smart dronies, touch fly, follow me, and flight plan. Now I'm going to de demonstrate the flight modes and camera settings in part two, but in the meantime, we're going to see how the Anafi does in the house. Now this drone will take off with or without GPS lock, so be mindful of that when putting the Anafi up as it may drift quite a bit until the GPS has locked on. Flying in the house, the drone did not lock onto GPS, but was still able to maintain stable flight with minimal inputs. The downward sensors worked well on a wood floor with lots of light. The drone is like many other drones that rely on optical flow for positioning when GPS is not available. The optical flow camera needs light to work properly, so it does not work well in low light conditions or highly reflective surfaces. I have found the DJI Spark and Mavic Pro will behave in much the same way when GPS is not available. The Anafi did extremely well at holding position right on par with the DJI Spark and the DJI Mavic Pro. So this concludes part one of our Anafi review. I'm really excited to get this drone out and really see what it can do. Please click on the links to see our other videos as we put the Anafi through its paces and put it up against the DJI Spark and the DJI Mavic Pro Platinum. So thanks for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this and our other travel videos, please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Have a great day and we'll see you next time.